Welcome everyone to Fundamentals of Kabbalah and Hasidut. We begin today a new mini series called Mysteries of Creation, where we will be looking at some of the very deep, profound myster mysteries of what we'll call Torah cosmology, the opening of the Torah, beginning with Bereshit in the beginning, through the first Shabbat. And with any subject that you begin, there is so much to say. Obviously, we will only be able to get to a certain amount each class. It's still undetermined how many classes this will be. I would imagine between three and five. That, I think that's a decent, uh, decent guess, probably four or five. That would only scratch the surface, truthfully. And my great interest in this subject was inspired by a series of classes that Rob Ginsburg gave we're talking about a good 40 years ago uh, in a, it's now a yeshiva, but it's right where the Kotel is. If everyone can imagine the Kotel. If everyone imagines where the bathrooms are. Above the bathrooms, there is a, a very well-known yeshiva now, but back then it was basically abandoned. and. I'm not sure how Rob Ginsburg had the merit to, to get use of one of the rooms there. And he gave a, a series of weekly classes over four months. I have all the notes. It was two hour classes. There were approximately 16 hours of classes, pretty much on the first verse of the Torah and a little about the first day and the first seven days. So if anyone has heard a class from Rob Ginsburg, a two hour class is like, it is so full. And I was just so inspired by those classes that every year when we get to Bray Sheet, I try to learn new things go back over uh, my old notes and see new levels and insight. So a lot of what we're going to be learning uh, are different teachings from Rav Ginsburg, going back to that class and um, up, to, up to recent times. As I said, I can only give over a few ideas each class, but I hope by the end of the series, uh, hopefully everyone will be uh, inspired to delve deeper into these mysteries on their own. So we're gonna start, for those who have a, a Torah in front of you, Chumash, from the second chapter, the fourth verse. And this might be a, a funny way to begin because there are, in a sense, two tellings of the story of creation. The first one goes through the seven days of creation and, and culminates in Shabbat Bereshit. And then begins what is called the second telling of the story, which after the first verse, that's what we're going to be delving into to begin this class. After the first verse, the, the focus is on Adam and Chava, Adam and Eve, their creation, the experience in the Garden of Eden, what happened with the tree of knowledge of good and evil, the whole eating from the tree, the expulsion, from the Garden of Eden. 
Adam and Eve were already created on the sixth day. So in the first telling of the creation story, it's already mentioned that Adam and Eve were created in the image of God. But most of the details are not given over what actually happened on that sixth day. And the second telling goes over it. Now, we're going to begin with this because th th this verse has five, we're going to call chidushim, five innovative ideas in it. And for those who either followed our series 70 Faces or have the book, so the premise of the book is there are not just 70 faces of the Torah, meaning 70 perspectives or, or 70 levels or 70 ways to see the Torah. Actually, the Arizal says there are 600,000 faces to the Torah, one for each root soul in Israel. So the idea, this is symbolic language, but what it's teaching us is that the Torah is virtually infinite in how we can look at it from person to person, from generation to generation. It is never old or stale. There always are new <clears throat> innovative ideas that are being revealed and, and, and born. The word Torah, the simple meaning of the word Torah is instruction from the word hora'a instruction. But it also is the same root as the word for pregnancy, harayon. And so we get a beautiful metaphor that the Torah is constantly in a state of pregnancy, ready to give birth to new ideas. But it's up to us to delve into it to reveal those new ideas. <clears throat> so in this verse that we're going to be starting with, there are five methods that the sages used to uncover these 70 faces. That was the premise of the book and the whole series that we did, is that to answer the question, well, how did the sages and the Kabbalists and the Hasidic Rebbe's how did they find all of these hidden messages, these illusions, these metaphors, allegories, parables in the Torah? How did they do it? So they had specific methods. So in this one verse, we're going to see five different methods revealing important ideas about the creation of the world. So Again, for those who want to follow, it's in the second chapter of Genesis, the fourth verse. And I will read, Eila toldot ha-shemayim va'aretz behibaram. That's the first part. These are the generations of the heavens and earth in their creation. Beyom asad Hashem elokim eretz v'shemayim. On the day that God, that Hashem Elohim, it's important, there are two names of God here, Hashem Elohim, the four-letter name of God, and the name Elohim, created earth and heaven. So we're going to go through these five innovative ideas, because it, it's going to connect us immediately back to the first verse of the Torah. So we'll, the first thing we'll notice is that this verse starts with the letter Aleph. So someone might ask, okay, many verses start with Aleph. If you look in the Bala Turing, the commentary called the Bala Turing, many, many times he'll explain the significance of why a verse begins with a certain letter and ends with a certain letter. So that's what we're looking at here. 
So here, the fact that the, the second telling begins with an Aleph refers us back to the first verse of the Torah, Bereshit bara Elohim at the where the Torah begins with a bet. And many commentators over the years have asked, why didn't the Torah begin with an Aleph? Aleph is the first letter. Aleph stands for oneness. Why didn't the Torah begin with an Aleph? Why a bet? And so among the many, many answers is that the bet of Bereshit, and it's a large bet, we know that it does not happen very often, but every one of the 22 Hebrew letters will appear at least one time large and one time small. So the first letter of the Torah is a large bet. And this represents from the number of bet. Bet is two. Before the two, there was only one. There was only an Aleph. So this Aleph, in a sense, is hidden. It, the Torah purposely doesn't start with an Aleph because the whole idea that there's now a creation is represented by the letter Bet, which means two. The, the, the uh, Martin Buber wrote a very famous book called I and Thou. This idea that before there was a thou, there was only the eye of God, as it were. So the Torah begins with a bet, and bet too represents all of the dualities of life. We live in a very, very dualistic world. But of course, our job, our purpose, especially on the spiritual level, is to see the oneness behind all plurality, represented by duality. And of course, that's represented in the Shema. Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. We are the witnesses. We are God's messengers to the world that despite the appearance of plurality and duality, ultimately it's all coming from one God and ultimately it's all part of one unity. Even science represents that and understands that. And that's today what's called the, the search for the theory of everything, is the attempt to put the four cardinal forces of the universe together. Started by Albert Einstein, the unified field theory. So here in the second telling, in a sense, it goes back to an even a more primordial look at the creation beginning with an Aleph. There's much more to be said about this and hopefully in the series we will develop this idea, especially the letter Aleph. So that's the first thing that sticks out in this sentence. The second thing is, the word toldot, generations. This word appears many times in the Torah, usually talking about the generations of people and lineage. Here, here's an example, again, one of the uh, ways that the sages were able to understand subtle secrets in the Torah. The word toldot can be spelled in three different ways. It can be spelled with one vav, or two vavs, or no vavs. Sometimes in the Torah it appears in one of those three ways. What's interesting is the way it appears here with two vavs, there's only two places in the entire Tanakh where the word toldot is written with two vavs. When it's not written with two vavs means there's something missing. And if, and if we would go through every appearance of toldot, there would be a hint to something that's not complete. 
Here, it's the beginning of creation. So the beginning of the creation is represented by the word generations being written with two vavs, full, malay. The only other place that it's written full is not even in the, in the five books of Moses, is in the book of Ruth. In the book of Ruth at the end, so it ends with the generations that came from the birth of a child to Ruth from Boaz that would lead to King David. And from King David will lead to Mashiach. There, the word toldot is written full because from Peretz to, to David, to Oved, to Yishai, to David, to Mashiach, that's like the full picture. If, you go, if we go back to the second verse in the Torah, we're told that the Spirit of God moved across the waters, hovered over the waters. And the Midrash says, what is this Spirit of God? So the Midrash answers, this is the Spirit of Mashiach. So here we can understand why the first time the word toldot appears in the Torah, it's full. And the only other time it appears, it's talking about the, the lineage that will, that will lead to Mashiach. So here's an incredible connection between the beginning of creation and what we'll call the end of days with the appearance of Mashiach. That is the second Chiddush we have here. The third one is, and this is a method that is discussed widely, when a word appears for the first time in the Torah, a word or a letter, that's called its major context, or its, Reb Shlomo used to call it the headquarters of understanding this word. So what word appears for the first time in the Torah here? The four letter name of God. A yud and a he and a vav and a he. Even though those who were at the Sunday class, we learned that in acronym, <clears throat> the name yud and he and vav he does appear in the seven days of creation in the first telling, but only as an acronym. <clears throat> this is the first time it appears. And this is very significant. And Rashi explains what, why isn't the name Yudke Vavke in the first time? So the, the Midrash says that Rashi brings that in the beginning, God thought to create the world solely from what's called the Midata Din, the aspect of judgment. And that's why the only name that, of God that appears in the first telling of the creation story is Elohim, 32 times. We will also get to the significance of those 32 times, but only the name Elohim. And the name Elohim, which equals 86, is the same gematria as the word Hateva, nature with like a capital N the idea of nature. We'll get to that, Toby. I don't know of, of, of actually a word in Hebrew. Rav Shlomo called it the headquarters. Rav Ginsburg calls it the initial context that a word appears. Pama Rishona, Pama Rishona. So, so Rashi continues, God thought in the beginning to create the world only from the aspect of judgment, meaning in a way, the world would work strictly according to what we'll call measure for measure. Mida connected mida. And that is how nature more or less works. The laws of nature, are 
are very predictable. When you get down to quantum physics, then you see that they're not totally predictable, but the way we experience nature is, mo is, is very clockwork, very clock clockwork. You can go to your website and ask, when will the sun rise, wherever you live, you ask, when will the sun rise tomorrow? And you'll get an exact minute. And the sun will rise at that minute. But then Rashi continues, God saw that the world, meaning really mankind, could not exist in a world that was totally clockwork. Why? It would leave no room for chuma. It, if you make a mistake, that's it. You're out. There's, there is no going back. There is no atonement. There is no for forgiveness. So God saw that the world needed compassion. So he put first the aspect of compassion. So this is connected to in the second telling, which, which I said in a certain way has a impression of an even deeper level than the first verse of the Torah. So here you have the name Yudke Vavke already. And we know that even though the name Yudke Vavke does not appear in the first telling, it's there the whole time. That's the importance of this here. The fourth thing is, I already mentioned that every letter in the Torah will appear at least once large and once small. In this verse, there's a small hey in the word behibaram. Going back where it says, these are the generations of heaven and earth in their creation. The he baram, the he is a small he. So how, how do we understand this? And we're go, I'm going to mention it now, and then we're going to expand on this idea in a few minutes, much, much deeper. And that is, it's, it says in the Gemara, this is another one of the methods that we learn in 70 faces is when the sages say, don't read the word this way, read it that way. Meaning if you permute the letters differently or you change the vowels, you can read it differently and another meaning pops out at you. So the sages said about this word, don't read it behibaram, Read it, be Avraham. Why? The, the, the letters of Avraham are in the word Behibaram. Behibaram are the same letters as be Avraham. So if you read this differently, is these are the generations of heaven and earth when they were created through the energy through the channel of Avraham. As I said, we're going to go into that deeper, but I'll mention here, so why is the hay small? Well, the hay is small here because, remember uh, Alice in Wonderland? So remember on the table, uh, there are these pills that go, eat me eat me, <laughs> like the neon lights are going out, like trying to get her attention, eat me. <laughs> and what happens? She either could become big or small. So those are like the big and the small letters. So why is this hay small? Because Avraham at first was not called Avraham. He was called Avram. And when God made a covenant with him through circumcision, 
he changed Avram's name to Avraham, meaning he added a hey, the letter hey to his name. Where is that hey coming from? Right here, Behi Baram, in this hey of creation. That's where the hay is coming from. So that was our fourth idea that pops out of this verse. And the last one is, if you'll notice, the beginning of the verse, the first half of the verse says, these are the generations of heaven and earth in that order. But then it says, on the day that Hashem Elohim created earth, and heaven, the opposite order. First, heaven and earth, then earth and heaven. So that's, again, it's like the pill is jumping out saying, explain me, explain me. So here you, you have a, a very, very uh, famous disagreement in the Gemara between Shammai and Hillel. Shammai over in what order did God create? Was it first the heavens and then the earth? Or first the earth and then the heavens? So Shammai says, the heavens and the earth. Just look at the first verse of the Torah. It says it. Hillel, unexpectedly, even though our verse also starts with heaven and earth, but like I said, there's something deeper in a sense about this verse than even the first verse of the Torah. And Hilo said, no, earth was created before heaven. Why? Because it says in this verse, it says in this verse that, that uh, heaven came, uh, uh, earth came first. And they, and they bring proofs and they argue back and forth. And then, uh, I didn't have a chance to look at it, but I believe it's Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai uh, expresses wonderment how these great sages were arguing over which is first, heaven or earth or earth and heaven. And the, the, the opinion is expressed, they were created simultaneously. A perfect Jewish solution to any problem. <laughs> Don't say these are mutually exclusive, because we could. Is Shammai right? Or is Hillel right? What came first? No, you can look at it. They were, they were created simultaneously. Ein Kasha. No disagreement here. So these are the five chidushim that jump out of one verse. So this is such a, a beautiful idea. This is like a training that when you look at a verse, remember some of you <clears throat> might have seen a, a, a well-known book called What's Bothering Rashi? This is used in curriculums everywhere where uh, the teacher will learn a verse and before they look at Rashi, like, what do you think? Is there something in this verse that you think Rashi might want to comment on? Is there something unusual? What, what jumps out of this verse? And I remember I didn't, there's actually a whole book. I didn't use the book, but at one time, it's going back 30 years, um, I taught in a Jewish uh, junior high and high school. And I used this method. When we learned, I would, that would, I would always say, what do you think would bother, not bother, but that Rashi would need to comment on? What's, what's unusual? What, what, do you, what do you see in this verse that needs explanation? So what we just did is a, is a great training how to look at the whole Torah. And here we found five very important ideas. So that's how we're starting. Now I said that when we were talking about this small hay that I, I would expand upon this, which I'm going to do right now. This is gonna be our second 
idea. And that is that the story of creation unfolds in seven days, six days of creation and Shabbat. But they're a whole, they're, they're a one entity. So it's really, we could say six days of creation, and that's true. And we could say seven days of creation. And the, and the sages even ask, well, why, why would we relate to Shabbat as a day of creation? Was there something missing? Was something created on Shabbat? And the sages actually say, yes. Menucha, rest. It was, there was something missing, as it were, in creation that it didn't end after six days. There was something actually critical, crucial, that still needed to be created, and that was rest, menucha. So we have seven days of creation. It's brought down in Kabbalah and Hasidut that these seven days of creation relate directly to the seven lower spherot. Chesed, Gevura, Tiferet, Netzach, Hod, Yesod, and Malchut. Right now, we're not going to go into any great uh, explanations of the seven spherot, but the ten spherot are the divine channels through which God creates and maintains a physical universe, a finite universe, an infinite God uses 10 channels in which to draw down his energy, life force, and light in order to animate and give life to reality. So the seven days of creation relate to the seven lower spherot. This may be one of the things that we're going to go into, but there's the correspondence, it works perfectly. The first day, we could see chesed. The second day, we could see gevura. The third, teferet. Then, I'll leave for another time. So the first day, though, is chesed. It's chesed. And remember, we said that in this verse that we just learned, these are the generations of heaven and earth in their creation. Don't read it in their creation. Read it in Avraham, through Avraham. So what is the, the sphera most associated with Avraham is chesed. Is chesed. So we have two verses that relate directly to chesed and creation. One is olam chesed yibane. That the world is created past, present, and in the future through chesed. So this is almost like saying through Avraham, because Avraham is the Merkava, is the channel of through which this energy enters into the world. Avraham is an archetypal figure. He spans the spiritual and physical universes like we all do but an archetypal figure does this on a, on a level beyond what most people um, can do so the going back to the big bet of beret sheet so there's a very we'll call it fanciful story. It actually has turned into a storybook for children. I used to read this to my children with pictures and everything, but it comes with the Zohar. And the Zohar says that when God wanted to create the world, all of the letters came before God and said, you should start the Torah with me because, and it starts in the last letter, actually, not the first letter, the last, the first letter, the Tav, comes and says, the word Torah begins with me. So you should begin the Torah with me. And each letter comes and uh, offers a reason why God should begin the Torah with them. And in response, God says, very nice idea. 
but, and we'll propose another word that also begins with that letter, which is not so positive. Until you go through all the letters to the letter bet. And bet says, my letter begins the word bracha, blessing. And with my letter, all of creation will come to bless you. Like we begin a hundred times a day. Baruch hata Hashem. A hundred times a day, we say a hundred blessings. And according to the Zohar, God says, I like that idea. <laughs> good, good going, good idea. Bet, I'll start the Torah with you. So when God first appears to Abraham and he tells him, go out, go to yourself, go away from your land, your birthplace and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And then he, he promises him that you're not going to lose out by doing this. There you will become great. And then he says, and there the haya bracha. There you will become a bracha. And so this is directly connected to this bet of Bereshit and this idea of Behi Baram is Avraham. Because the sages read, it's not just that God said to him, you will be a blessing. But God continues, especially when he changes his name. And he adds the hey and says, all of the nations of the world will be blessed through you. Not only will you be blessed, but you will have the power to bring blessing to everyone. So this has to do with the actual purpose of creation and its connection to Abraham. The first day of creation ends, Vayi era vayi boker yom echad. There was evening and there was morning, one day. Later, Rashi points out, that, oh, actually, right there, he points out, why doesn't it say it was evening and it was morning the, the first day? Because all the other ones are the second day, the third day, the fourth day, not two days, three days. Only this one is, it was called one day. So Rashi there says, because God had not even created the angels yet. In other words, there was no other being other than God, even through the first day, even though the big bed of Rashid is representing there's now something other than God. But on a deep level, it was still all part of God's oneness, what we would call maybe Atsilut, the world of Atsilut, where there's no difference between the, the light and the, and the vessels. It's all godly. So why am I explaining that here in relationship to Abraham? Because there is a verse in the, in the prophets, and I'm sorry, I did not write down the source of this. Any of you can go to my website, go to the Gematria search and put in text instead of Gematria, put in the word Echad, and you'll get every single place that the word Echad appears in the entire Tanakh, including this verse I'm about to tell you, which says, Echad Haya Avraham. One was Avraham. What it means was unique. Just like actually some uh, prayer books, Sidurim, now translate instead of in the Shema, Hashem Echad. God is one. Some are now translating God is unique. Meaning, as, the, as it says in the Zohar, that God is achad velo v'chushpan. 
He's one, but not in the sense of a number one, two, three, four. God's oneness is totally unique. There's no, nothing that can compare to it. It's not like the one of the mathematical progression of one, two, three. So the reason I'm bringing this is because Avram is called Echad Haya Avraham. That Avram is, is the channel for this kind of oneness. Because it was Avram who, we'll call it discovered, realized that there was only one God. And the mission of the, of the Jewish people from that time to this day, till Mashiach and even beyond, is to teach, announce, and be witness to the oneness of God in the world. So Echad Haya Avram is connected to this first day of creation the purpose of creation. And this goes along with the Midrash that says that when God, the thought arose in God's mind to create the world, of course, we're talking in human terms, Yisrael Allah b'machshavat t'chila. Israel arose in God's mind first. And who is the first of Israel? Avraham. So all of this is really an extension of that little hay in the word Bihibaram. Don't read it Bihibaram. Read it Avraham. So for all the reasons that I just discussed, that is why the sages saw that in, in, in this word, Bihibaram. They saw that there is an intrinsic connection between Avraham and the creation of the world. So I'll mention here at the end that in the Shema, we know that there are two large letters, an ayin and a dalit, the ayin of the word Shema here, and the dalit of the word Echad, meaning God is one. And they spell out aid, witness, and they're large letters. It's the, I believe it's the only verse in the entire Tanakh that has two large letters in one verse. It's so rare to have a, a large letter, but here's two in one verse, witness. So here's a very, very beautiful idea. And, and we'll conclude this idea with that is that when we make Kiddush on Shabbat, when we sanctify the Shabbat, and what we're reading is from the seventh day of creation. We're reading from the creation story, that God completed the work of creation, and he rested, and he sanctified the seventh day. And we do it over a cup of wine. And it's customary that Friday night, we stand during the Kiddush. And so the question is asked that what we're actually doing in a sense by making Kiddush is we're testifying to our belief that God created the world, which is a beautiful idea. That's what we're doing. We're like giving witness. But then the question is asked, how can you give witness if you weren't there? I mean, we read in the Torah that God rested on the seventh day. So I, I can give witness that I read it in the Torah and I believe it. But how can I really give witness in, in, in a factual kind of way? In other words, you have to be there. You have to see it. And so the, the very deep, profound answer is on a very, very deep level, we were there. And this explains the Midrash that says that when God wanted to create the world, he asked the opinion of the souls of the tzaddikim, of the righteous. So we asked another question. 
what souls, what righteous. There's no world. There's no creation. There's nothing but God. Who is he talking to? What does it mean he took advice from the souls of the righteous? And so the answer that since our souls are an actual part of God above, this Midrash is, is in a sense, recording an inner conversation that God is having with his self, a dialogue, an inner dialogue. As it were, just like we talk to ourselves 24-7, God also, in a, in a sense, again, in human terms, is thinking the world into being at every second. So here, we could stand during Kiddush and give testimony to not just our belief that God created the heavens and the earth, but in a sense, we were there and witnessed it. Now, this is a very, very deep idea. Hopefully, everyone will um, take the time to meditate on this. Okay, we're going to have one more, one more idea here, and okay, I'm going to, I'll do th this one. Like I said in the beginning, it's virtually infinite. So this is our, our, our beginning. We will continue by looking at the words the verses, the ideas of the seven days of creation and see what we can learn. Uh, but we will, we will keep it to a four or five uh, class uh, mini series. If not, we would literally spend the entire year on, on this subject. So the idea that I want to end with, I want to go back to this idea that in the beginning, God wanted or thought to create the world only from the aspect of judgment or meter connect and meter measure for measure, <clears throat> the laws of nature. But he saw that the world could not exist. And he added, in fact, even the, the word is he put first compassion. So there's an incredible numerical hint to this. And that is the following is there are many, many types of gematria, of, of Jewish numerology through which we delve into deeper meanings. So the typical gematria is each letter has a numerical value. And therefore, any word which is made up of letters, you can also translate them into numbers. You add the numbers of a word and you get its sum total. And then you look what other words have the sum total, or what other phrase or what other verse. And then you start making comparisons. And this is where deep ideas start just connecting, connecting the dots, that it becomes like a web, a matrix of meanings that are hidden from the, the, the eye until you start doing this. But there are many, many types of gematria, of numerology. One of them is called ordinal. In Hebrew, it's mispar uh, siduri. So instead of giving a value to each letter, each letter has a value by its position in the 22 letters of the alphabet. So therefore, the first 10 letters have the value of 
1 through 10. The 11th letter, which is Chaf, in regular gematria equals 20. But in ordinal counting, it's 11 because it's the 11th letter. The 12th letter is the Lamed. It equals 30. But in ordinal, it equals 13. And so on up to the 22 letters. So therefore, you can take a verse and add up its ordinal positions to get a number, and then you analyze that number. So I actually just learned this uh, last week, and I was just like uh, amazed. So the, when you add up all of the letters of the first verse of the Torah, it equals 298, which equals the word rachamim, which equals this midrash that God thought to create the world from mida to din, but saw that he had to add rachamim. So we said that the name Yudke Vavke does not appear in the first telling of the story. And that's why we saw it in the first verse of the second telling of the story. But here you have in the first verse an illusion, a hint that Rachamim is, is stamped into the first verse of the Torah. Again, the ordinal value of the first verse equals Rachamim. But we're not done yet. But when you take the first two words, Bereshit bara, in the beginning God created, that, if you just take the ordinal value of those two words, in the beginning God created, Bereshit bara equals 64. 64 equals the word din. That's what we said, that God thought to create the world from Midah ta din, but added Rachamim. So here you see in ordinal counting in the first verse, this concept that Rashi brings. But we don't, we, we don't necessarily understand how did the sages get this? Where did they, where did they learn this? Where did they see this? So we could say one of two things. I, I can't give you a definitive answer. Either they understood just philosophically, intellectually, mystically, spiritually, that this is the case, the fact that only the name Elohim appears in the first telling. But then all of a sudden in the second telling, the name Yudke Vavke appears. So that also is like, well, this needs explanation. Well, how did that, how did that happen? And so we get this explanation that really from the beginning there was compassion. But then there's another way is that many times a student of Torah, he will be learning a verse and meditating on the verse and looking at the letters in the verse and looking at the numbers of the verse. And what I just gave over might have popped out to one of the sages and said, ah, that's how we understand that the name Yudke Vavke is only in the second telling, but it was really there from the beginning. And that helped create this Midrash. Now, it could go either way. And it does go both ways for different people at different times. But I do want to point out something extremely important that until this day, a scribe is called a sofer. A sofer, the word sofer means a counter, someone who counts. A, 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 a number in Hebrew is, a, is mispar, from the same root, is, is sofer. So we would ask the obvious question, why is a 
person who writes a Sefer Torah called a counter? Shouldn't he be called a writer? Why is he called a counter? And this tells us something very, 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 very important is that throughout the Torah, there is a mathematical code in every word of the Torah, every verse of the Torah, every passage in the Torah, every parsha in the Torah, every book of the Torah. There are secrets upon secrets upon secrets upon secrets. And of course, different Kabbalistic books delve into this. Especially in our day, Rabbi Ginsburg is a master of Torah mathematics, of the code hidden in the Torah. And in his, I think the latest count was 180 volumes of books, <laughs> are quite literally tens of thousands. And I, I'm not... I'm not uh, exaggerating whatsoever. Tens of thousands of, of innovative ideas based on the numerical mathematical code of the Torah. So all I'm saying is that in the olden days, a sofer was called a sofer because he, it wasn't that he just wrote the Torah. He knew the secrets of the numerology of the Torah. That was part and parcel of his wisdom. So I just learned this last week. And that's encouraging to all of us. Next week, I'll show you um, uh, the, the book I've been learning from. Maybe actually in a few minutes, I'll show you. And I was just blown away by how many new ideas. And this is after uh, many years of studying uh, Bereshi. But like I said, at, at most, we're going to scratch the surface here. Anyways, this is a good place to stop. I want to end with a bracha. Remember, the big bet of Breshit is blessing. This is, this is a big part of what creation is all about. It's a big part of our daily lifestyle. We say a hundred blessings a day. A hundred blessings a day. It's not just a creation story, Torah cosmology. This is has, has an, a direct effect in how we how we live our lives in an observant lifestyle, 100 blessings a day. So we should all be blessed to love the Torah, delve into the Torah, to always be amazed by the Torah. And this year, Tav Shin Pei Gimel, Tia Shana Pelagadol. This year should be a great wonderment. A great wonderment should be revealed this year. So I want to bless us all as we start a new year of learning fundamentals of Kabbalah and Hasidut that we do it, but Pelagadol, we do it with great wonder.